realm of the spirit i saw that the earth is about to go through another shift uh, in this vision i could see these vacancies and voids in the earth it's as if there were mantles that were there that were just left hanging over the earth that no one had picked up all of a sudden i saw this army of believers that begin to rise up and they begin to pick up these mantles and walk in a dimension of the supernatural that we have never seen before they receive new mandates they receive new assignments from heaven it's as if a lion was awakened on the inside of them i believe that that is the time that we're coming into and i wrote about this in my new book mantled for greatness this is going to be your time to rise up in your kingdom authority not only do I speak about a mantle and what the assignment of your mantle is, I talk about how to unlock a God-sized dream. You can pre-order this book wherever books are sold, Amazon, Barnes & Noble. It's going to be released on October 3rd, but you can pre-order it now. It's your time to rise up in your anointing, in your authority. You are being mantled for greatness. Welcome, everybody. Come on in. I see you all joining me from uh, all across uh, social media platforms. We, you're watching from YouTube, from Facebook, and from Instagram Live. Uh, so come on in. Welcome to uh, the prophetic forecast. I do believe that there is a word from the Lord for you uh, specifically. And uh, this is one of those words that uh, I believe is going to cause something to change in your life and something to happen in your spirit. And so I can't wait to get into this. But just before we do, I want you to let me know where you're watching from, what city, what state, uh, what country are you joining in from? I see so many of you already on here. Uh, you're watching from Texas. I see you on uh, from New York. Uh, New York City is watching. I see you watching from Jamaica. You're jumping on from Virginia. You're watching from Orlando. Chicago is on. Georgia is on. You guys are coming on from everywhere. Uh, just comment and let me know what city, what state, or what country uh, are you joining in from. And then if you don't mind, do me a favor and hit the share button. If you're watching on Facebook, uh, you can hit share. If you're watching on YouTube, you can hit like, tag someone in it, let them know. Uh, there's a word from the Lord. This word uh, I'm going to speak on is about a plot twist that we are going to see this year. That's right. 2023, there's a plot twist that's about to happen. And uh, I, I'm excited to share this with you because I believe that this is one of those significant words that's going to help push you into another chapter for your life. But I'll give you just a moment to come on in. Again, you guys are, are watching across platforms right now. So uh, some of you on YouTube, Facebook, and even Instagram Live. Uh, so wherever you're watching from, uh, let me know what city, what state, or what country are you watching from? I see you uh, jumping on here from Ohio. You're watching from California. Uh, you guys are watching from uh, Miami, Florida. Minnesota is on. Uh, that's right. Go ahead and post in the comments. A plot twist is coming. Just post that plot twist. I see you on from uh, the UK. You're watching. You're watching from Dunn, North Carolina. Nevada is on here. Uh, you guys are joining in from around the world. And I'm excited that you're on uh, because there's so much for us to uh, get into uh, so much for us to unpack. And I want to start by opening in prayer. I see you, Trinidad, on here. So many of you jumping on from other countries. We've got uh, a group of you, thousands of you, uh, that watch from other countries. And so welcome on uh, to this Monday Live, to the prophetic forecast. I want to talk about a plot to us, but let's jump into uh, prayer, and then we'll get right into this word. So, Father, we just thank you for the opportunity to gather from around uh, the nations of the world, coming together uh, to exalt your name, to lift you up, Holy Spirit, to commune and to meet with you. And so we invite you into this live broadcast. We invite you in, Father, because if you're not in it, we don't want to even be a part of it. So I ask you, Holy Spirit, speak through me. Uh, a word directly to the hearts of your people. And Father, I pray that 
that there would be change that would occur, that there would be such a prophetic thrust that would come as people are watching this, wherever they're watching it from, at whatever time they're watching it in. And we give you praise for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Listen, uh, if you're just jumping on here, if you're watching from Facebook, hit share. Uh, if you're watching from uh, YouTube, go ahead and hit like, share it with someone, tag someone in it. Uh, I want to get further into uh, this word. The Lord began to turn my attention to the book of Job. And uh, whenever I look at the book of Job, this is one that I don't look at uh, just lightly. That's not one of those books that you just turn to and you decide you want to do a devotional from Job. Whenever I read that particular book, uh, whether I'm reading the beginning portion of it or even the end or all of it, I've done studies on it. Uh, it's one of those books that the Holy Spirit has to really lead me to. And he has to lead me to that for several reasons. And I see some of you already on here saying it's the same for you. But he has to really lead me to that because I want to make sure uh, when I read Job that that I have the understanding of what it is that Holy Spirit is wanting to communicate with me. Now, the book of Job is is an amazing uh, work. When you read it, uh, there are several things that I want to bring to your attention that many people may not be aware of. But the book of Job is the oldest oldest book of the Bible. Uh, it was the first book that was written uh, in, in history. When we look uh, at scripture from a historical standpoint, Job was the first book that was written. Now, I know many people think Genesis because it is first uh, and because it is there uh, in the beginning, but Job actually predates the book of Genesis. And that's important for us to understand because whenever the Lord writes something first, Whenever he puts something in place first, uh, it starts something in the realm of the spirit. And from that, we can get uh, somewhat of the law of first mentions. If it's mentioned in Job first or in a particular order first, it sets the tone and the pace for what's to come uh, after that. And so now, I don't want anyone to be afraid, uh, but I'm going to go into this because the Lord began to turn my attention uh, to the book of Job. And he told me this is where the body of Christ is right now now. And I know some of you like, hold up, you know, what do you mean that we're here? But the Lord said to me, this is where the body of Christ is right now. And to really unpack this so that you can understand where we're headed and the plot twist that is about to come. And so I'm going to use this passage. I'm going to look at the context of the passage, but then we're going to look at it from a prophetic perspective and understand what the Lord is saying through that passage for now. So I want to read this for you. So just go with me. We're going to jump around. Around, uh, but just go with me to Job chapter uh, 1, verse 6. It says, now there was a certain day or a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. It says, and Satan also came among them. Pay attention to that because there are many people that assume uh, that Satan cannot come before God, but he did. Uh, even though he is a fallen angel, he was at time one of the sons of God. And when the Bible speaks of sons of God in Job chapter one and chapter two, it's speaking about what we know as angels. But I believe it goes a step further because the word angel is messenger, but it goes a step further than that to those that God created. And some of you saying, hold on, I thought Jesus was the only son of God. Well, the Bible doesn't say that. The Bible says that Jesus is the only begotten son. There's a difference between a son and a begotten son. The word begotten there, uh, you'll see it in uh, old English translations in King James. That word means the same. So there is a difference because he's saying uh, in scripture that Jesus is the only son that is the same. In other words, he came directly from God because he was God in the flesh. Now, uh, that's important for us to understand. But in Job, uh, the Bible speaks of the sons of God, meaning these angels that gathered. And here is Satan gathering with them. But listen to this. This is what God says uh, in uh, verse eight. It says, then the Lord said to Satan. Have you, well, he first asked him, where did you come from? And then Satan answered the Lord and said, from going to and fro in the earth and from walking back and forth on it. Verse eight says, then the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? He automatically knew 
that Satan was looking for some kind of destruction that he can get into. Now, why is this important for us to deal with? Because the oldest book of the Bible, Job, gives us understanding that Satan does not work on his own accord, that even Satan has to report to God whatever it is that he's doing. He has to get permission in order to do it. And if you are a believer, you need to just start rejoicing right there because that means that no attack that has come against you, no weapon that has ever been formed against your life, your family, your ministry is able to prosper because Satan does not work for himself. He has to get permission. And that's when you know that the whole thing is rigged, that even though the weapon might be formed, it cannot prosper if God doesn't allow it. And let me tell you this, the Lord's not allowing the weapons of the enemy to prosper against your life. You are the only one that can open yourself up to it and allow it to affect you. But God says, I'm not going to allow it to prosper. So even Satan had to come and get permission. Let's read just a little bit further in this. And I'm telling you, this word right here is going to bless your life. I'm going to go further into it. And then I'm going to unpack the prophetic meaning of it for you specifically. Uh, but the Bible says that now, the Lord asked Satan, have you considered my servant Job? So it brings into perspective that sometimes we think that we are being attacked when really the Lord is favoring us and considering us. And if God were to mention Job uh, in uh, the way that he did, if he mentions you in that kind of way to say that uh, you you are one that has not turned against him, that you have, have kept praise in your lips, that this is the kind of language that he began to speak about Job. He says, have you considered him? He's blameless and upright. He fears God and he shuns evil. It says, so Satan answered the Lord and said, does Job fear God for nothing? In other words, yeah, he fears you, but he only fears you because you got a hedge around him. And that's what the Bible says in verse 10. It says, have you not made a hedge around him, around his household and around all that he has on every side? It says, you bless the work of his hands and his possessions have increased in the land. It says, but now stretch out your hand and touch all that he has and he will surely curse you to your face. Now look at look at Satan uh, speaking of Job in this way. He's the accuser. He's coming to say, no matter how much you blessed him, no matter what you've done for him, if you were to touch what he has, he says he's going to curse you. He'll curse you to your face. And so I believe that there are some of us that are in a place in our lives right now uh, where we are upright before the Lord. We're walking before the Lord and we fear him. And the accuser of the brethren comes to say, well, you're only uh, rejoicing and praising God because everything is going well. But there are many of you on here that the Lord considered us. He allowed us or allows us to go through situations and trials that don't feel comfortable to us. He allows us to go through situations that uh, we, we feel as though we're under attack, but yet we're able to keep our praise. We're able to continue to worship him and we have not lived left him nor cursed him. And so that is the commitment that we have before the Lord. And there are many of you on here that say, I have that same commitment. I don't care what comes and what goes. I don't care what I've lost. I don't care what I've been through. God is with me and I'm not going to leave him. And that's what Job uh, experienced in his life. And I'll skip around. You know this story. So I'm not going to spend a long time on this part of the story. But when we come to Job chapter two, this is where I'm getting to. Again, the Bible says, again, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord and Satan came also among them. So this is not just a one time thing here in Job. It's showing us that this is what happens, that the sons of God come before the court of heaven and they must present themselves and they have to give an account of what they have been doing. And even though Lucifer is a fallen angel, he himself has to come before the court of heaven and to present himself himself. 
and he has to give an account of what he has been doing. And so again, uh, uh, here he comes before God and it says in verse three, the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? He's saying it again, that there is none like him in all the earth. Now, at this point, Job had already lost everything that he had. His sons and daughters were killed. He lost all of his cattle. His house burnt down. Everything that he had was completely lost. But the Bible says this, that again, God is saying, well, have you considered him? And so he says he's blameless and upright. One who fears God and shuns evil. And still he holds fast to his integrity. Although you enticed me against him to destroy him without a cause. There was no cause for that attack. There was no cause for what Job went through. But here he says, you enticed me against him to destroy him. But he still held on to his integrity. So Satan answered the Lord and said, skin for skin. Yes, all that a man has, he will give for his life. But stretch out your hand now and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will surely curse you to your face. You know the story. And this is exactly what God did. He gave him a cancer where it was boils that begin to come out on his skin to the point that Job wanted to die, but he could not die. Now, the point that I'm getting to is verse 11. Now, pay attention to this because many of you are in this exact place right now. Verse 11, it says, now, when Job's three friends heard of all his adversity or this adversity that had come upon him, each one came from his own place. Eliphaz came, Bildad came, and Zophar. And it says, for they had made an appointment together to come and mourn with him. King James says they came to bemoan him. In other words, they came to grieve his condition and to grieve his state. And so verse 11 is important because we're getting ready to transition into a new Hebrew year. And I'll be teaching on that in uh, the weeks to come. But this is so important to understand that anytime we cross over into a new spiritual season and a new spiritual place, it is important to assess the friends and those that are connected to you. You have to assess them. I'm not telling you go and cut people off. I understand that that is uh, uh, what people say when we cross over into a new year or season. But what I'm telling you is that you must begin to assess who is attached to you. Who is it that's connected to you in the spirit? Because you want to make sure you know what their heart is. What is their motive? What are they like? And what is their intent toward me? If you're in ministry, you better begin to assess those that are connected to you in ministry. You have to begin to put people in their proper place. This doesn't mean that you have to cut everybody off. But what it does mean is I need Need to know uh, how uh, you are positioned with me. Are we connected in the same place? Are we after the same thing? Are we uh, both pursuing the same God agenda? And if we're not, we have to make some changes. And so let's go back into this because I guarantee you, many of you've read this, but it's possible that you've missed some components of this that's going to help you. So let me go back to reading this in Job chapter two, verse 11. It says now these three friends came together to bemoan him or to mourn with him and to comfort him. It says in verse 12, and when they raised their eyes from afar and did not recognize him, they lifted their voices and they wept. Each one tore his robe and sprinkled dust on his own head toward heaven. So they sat down with him on the ground seven days and seven nights. No one spoke a word to him, but they saw that his grief was very great. For seven days and for seven nights, none of his friends spoke a word to him, but they looked at his condition and they begin to grieve and see the grief that was on him. And when you read on in the next chapters, Job's friends, one by one, begin to falsely accuse him. And they said, surely you did something to bring this on you. You had to offend God in some way for your life to be in the place that it's in right now. And I want to speak just for a moment to those of you that have been faithful in serving the Lord. I want to speak just for a moment to those of you that have been faithful in doing what God has called you to do. And you kept the command of the Lord. You followed the instruction of the Lord, but your life does not match your, your place of service to God. I, I want to speak to those just for a moment. And we don't often 
address this in the church, but this needs to be addressed because there are times in your life where you're following the plan of the Lord. You're doing what he called you to do. You're following after him. You're giving, you're sowing, you're being kind even to your enemy, but yet your life looks like it is just in complete turmoil. And you're saying, God, did I do something wrong? And I'm not speaking of when there's hidden sin or secret areas of offense, but I'm talking about when you know that you've been serving the Lord, but you're looking at your family, you're looking at your situation and you're saying, God, you, what did I do to offend you? You've been repenting, you've been fasting, you've been praying. And this is what Job's friends begin to do. They each came to him and they said, well, one said, well, you haven't given to the poor enough. And so this is why all of this has happened to you. It's the reason why you lost your family. It's the reason why your house burned down. Well, maybe it's because you've cursed God secretly in your heart. And Job began to go back and forth with them now, at a point saying, this didn't happen. I, I haven't done that. But he even began to wonder, did I curse God? Is there something that I did that was wrong? Maybe I did offend him. And each one of them came. Now, let me, let me give you this from a different perspective. Each of Job's friends, uh, they don't just represent his friends because you attract a part of who you are. So each of Job's three friends actually represents uh, a portion of Job's life that was in direct conflict to his purpose and his assignment. So each of Job's friends represents a portion of his life that was in direct conflict to his destiny and his purpose. And I'll prove it to you because whenever the Bible speaks of key people and, and the Bible focuses in the book of Job so on Job's friends that it's just, it goes chapter after chapter chapter. And so this made me go and look up the names of each of Job's friends. And the Lord began to have me do this study. I've done this study extensively. And when I begin to search the names of Job's friends, they have specific meaning to where Job was in his life. Friend number one. So the Bible says that Eliphaz came uh, to him. This friend's name means gold or my God is gold. Now pay attention to this because I'm telling you this word is going to help shift you from one place in your life to the next. This first friend of Job, his name means my God is gold. Now, why would Job have a friend whose name literally means to worship gold or my God is gold? And so when you look and begin to study this deeper in scripture, you'll see that this friend that Job had, even though he began to falsely accuse Job, that he didn't give enough to the poor or you haven't done enough for others. He in his own self uh, represented idol worship that he began to worship gold and materialism. It represented idol worship. And so here is Job in conflict with the God of gold. In other words, the God of this world. He was in conflict with worshiping something that was other than the spirit of God or the true and living God. And so I'm telling you this because there are tests that you will have to endure and pass. And sometimes a test is going to come through a person. I found that whenever the Lord gets ready to bless you, he will send a person into your life. But whenever the devil gets ready to try to attack you, many times he will duplicate and he he will send a person into your life. And I'm sharing this because some of you are saying, well, Lord, what's going on with my circle? And I, I want to address this in a balanced way. What's going on with my circle? And we can point the finger at people that are friends of ours that are in our circle, but they only represent a portion of our life because you attract who you are. And if something wasn't in us that attracted them, uh, then they wouldn't be there in our lives. And so it's easy to point to other people and say, well, I'm in this because of them. Or they're the ones that caused me to get into this situation. But when you really look at Job's life, here comes Eliphaz, whose name means my God is gold. He represented idol worship. He represented a choice that Job had to make. Am I going to uh, be so upset at the material things that I've lost? Am I going to elevate that above God? 
Let me let me let me just say this. Am I going to elevate uh, the possessions that I have or don't have? Some of us, our faith, we have based our faith on what we have. So when you have more money, you assume uh, that you're doing right and God's pleased with you. When you have less money, you assume that something is wrong and God is upset with you. And that is the biggest lie and deception in the body of Christ. Our God does not measure our faith or our character based upon our personal material prosperity, because there is something deeper than natural prosperity, and that is soul prosperity. And that's what the Lord really measures. He's not looking on the outward appearance. He's looking on the heart of an individual. And some of you are in a place right now where you're saying, I don't have a whole lot of money. I don't have a whole lot of material things. And you've been thinking, well, God, maybe you're upset with me because I wanted the house and I didn't get it. Maybe I did something wrong because I went after that job and I didn't get the job. And the Lord is saying that there are many of you on here that even though you don't have the house, you don't have the money, you don't have the job, you've got bigger faith than many of the people right there in your circle, in your community, in your world. I've traveled over uh, to some of the most remote uh, countries countries and villages. I've been throughout uh, parts of Africa into some of the developing nations, and I met some people that had more faith than some of the people that I know that have millions of dollars. Even though their economy is in a mess, and even though uh, they're scraping to try to make it, they're trusting God in it. And so our faith cannot be predicated upon how much we have in our bank account. And God is going through the church right now to uproot that lie, because there's been an out of balance, false prosperity kind of thing that has gone in the body of Christ to the point that uh, people have said, well, God's pleased with me. So that's why I got this job. And he he's happy with me. So that's why I have money. And the devil is a liar because the day is getting ready to come uh, where many people that have amassed fortunes are going to lose them. And there are many people in the world and even in the institution of the church that have amassed uh, great sums of money that are going to lose them. And the Lord is going to allow uh, for periods of testing where he's going to allow you to be tested to see if you are going to continue to keep your integrity, even when you're going through great loss. Now, I know that that's a word that many people don't want to hear. I know that many people, because I'm not prophesying a car and a house to you because I'm not prophesying uh, your next great uh, thing that you're getting ready to get. But there comes a time where your faith has to be tried. And when the Lord has tried your faith, he will then see that your faith is not based on what you have, that even when you have lost money and you've lost things, that you'll still serve him. And that's when you know that you can be trusted by God. Because see, there's a great transfer that is coming. It will be a transfer of wealth. It's going to be abundance that's going to sit on the body of Christ. But the Lord is going to allow many of us to go through another vetting period where we're going to have to be trusted to carry it because God's not going to give you something that's going to destroy you. He's not going to put something over into your hands that's going to pull you further away from him. So he's got to make sure that your character is right and that you can handle the great release that's about to come. And there is a great release that's coming. And so, Job went through a series of testing. Now, let me tell you the other names of his friends. So number one, Eliphaz, whose name means my God is gold. Here is Job in a direct conversation with my God is gold. He's in this conversation with um, this person that represents material idolatry. And he's having a dialogue with this individual. Then the next friend comes. Uh, his name is Bildad. And then the next friend whose name is Zophar. Now, one means sparrow. Now, in scripture, when the Bible talks about a sparrow, uh, we, we sang songs about it for years. His eye is on the sparrow. He watches or takes care of the birds. It represents provision. So he's having now a conversation uh, with uh, this person who represents provision that is looking at him saying, well, the reason why you don't have the provision is because you had to offend God. You had to have done something so wrong in your life that you're in a place now where you're in need. You're in a place now where you're in lack. You're in a place now where he's saying you, you had to transgress and that's why you're in this place. And then the third friend, which is a very interesting name, his name means confusing, mingling love. 
Let me say that again. The third friend, his name means confusing, mingling love. In other words, it deals with your affection. Are you going to put your affection on people, on things, on, on something outside of God, or is your affection going to be on the Lord? And so Job is having this conversation with the God of gold. He's having this conversation uh, with provision. Uh, while he's facing lack in his life, he's having this conversation with confusing love, meaning the affection is twisted. Something's all twisted up. And so while he's having this conversation, he still would not curse God. He still would not turn from the true and living God. He gets to the place. Now let's fast forward to uh, chapter 42, Job uh, 42. When we get to chapter 42, and I'm going somewhere with this, and I'm telling you it's going to bless your life. When we get to chapter 42, there are 6,000 of you that are watching this live right now between YouTube, Facebook, and Instagram live. And I hope you're getting this word. And so when we get to chapter 42, everything begin to change. And I'm telling you that this season that you have been in, the Lord says that many of you are about to step over into a chapter 42 moment in your life. Many of you are about to step over into a chapter 42 moment in your life. What does this mean? Let me tell you what it means. Let's read now Job 42. And I'm telling you, this is going to bless your life. Now, finally, uh, God begins to speak. You go through the entire book of Job, chapter after chapter after chapter, and not until you hit like chapter 40 does God actually begin to speak. This means that for 30-something chapters, God is not even speaking. This is Job's friends dialoguing with him, and then there is a young boy that begins to step in and dialogue, but God doesn't speak until the end of the book. And when we get to the end of the book, finally the Lord begins to say to Job, where were you when I put the stars in the sky? Where were you when I put creation into existence. He begins to call him out now. And so Job then in chapter 42 begins to repent because he says, now I've seen God. He said, I've heard you and I've heard about you. You've visited me on many occasions, but, but this is the first time that I've seen you. And the Bible says in chapter 42 of Job, he says, I've seen you and now I'm undone. I see my own folly and sin. And let me tell you this, it's impossible to have a true encounter with, with Holy Spirit, to have a true encounter with Jesus and not see your own shortcoming in your own self. And that doesn't mean that you've created or done some big, huge sin. But what it means is that our righteousness is as a filthy rag. It means that no matter how good we are, that we still don't measure up in and of ourselves, that we are only the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, that we are only made righteous in and through him. And so just Job finally got it. He understood that even though he possibly had given to the poor and he had helped many people, and even though he had kept his integrity, that when he had an encounter with God, he said, I'm undone. He, he said, I've seen you and I repent of my sin. So that was number one. He had to then acknowledge that just in his own doing that he needed to repent. And then the Bible begins to say this, that God began to kindle his wrath against Job's friends. He began to address the friends of Job, Job and he said, uh, you instructed him wrong. You falsely accused him. What you said about him was not right. And so the anger of the Lord was kindled against them. And he said, listen, if you pray, I'm not going to receive it. But the only person I'm going to receive is if Job comes to me on your behalf. Let me tell you this. There are people that have done you wrong. There are some of you on here watching this. There are people that have falsely accused you. They have lied on you. There are some that have betrayed you. There are some that have gone after you. They've done everything that they have that they could against you. But God is saying, okay, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to hear your prayer concerning them. And so he said, I'm not going to listen to them because of the wickedness that I found in them. But he says, only if Job prays for you, will I hear and accept that as an offering unto me. There are between six and 7,000 of you watching this live on here across all the different platforms. And listen, you're not on here just by happen chance. You are not on here just just because you decided to go and scroll through. God has you on here because he's saying there's some people that betrayed you, but now the season of vindication is getting ready to come on your life. 
Somebody needs to get this word. I just want you to type that in the comments that vindication is coming. Now, let me explain to you how this vindication is going to come. There's a plot twist that's about to happen. Some of you have suffered. You've been in turmoil. You've gone through seasons where everything was broken down. You've gone through seasons of attack where it looks like you lost everything. Your family was under attack. Your marriage was under attack. But the Lord says, get ready for the plot twist that is about to come in your life. This is going to be such a major plot twist for you that the Lord says, now I'm going to put you in a position where you're going to have to intercede for your friends. You're going to have to intercede for the very ones that attacked you, the very ones that betrayed you, the very ones that came against you. Now God says, I'll hear your prayer concerning them. Now, Job could have gone and said, well, I'm not going to pray for them because of what they did. I'm not going to pray for them because of how they betrayed me. I needed them there as friends, but they walked off and left me or they falsely accused me. That was not the heart of Job. And so this was his final test. And some of you, the Lord says, this is your final test before promotion comes in the next season. Can you pray for the ones that came against you? Can you pray for the ones that attacked you? Can you pray for those that the enemy used to try to tear you down? Can you pray for those that threw stones at you and tried to kick you while you were already down? Can you stand in a place of prayer for them and not pray evil towards them? Let me say that again, because there's so much going on in the body of Christ where people are releasing curses on people and calling it God. And it's not God. But can you pray from the right heart and posture and say, Lord, bless them in spite of what they have done? This is what Jesus said that we should do. He said that we are to bless our enemies. That word bless is the Greek word eulogio. It's where we get the word eulogy from. Uh, and it means to give a final good remark on a situation. This means that Jesus didn't say you got to go out to eat with your friends. He didn't say you got to go and, and be buddy, buddy with them. What he did say is that you've got to give a final remark of blessing concerning them and the situation. And so here is Job in this position where the Bible says he prayed for his friends. And God received his prayer and his anger began to turn from those friends because Job prayed for the next 60 seconds. You're watching me. But the Lord says you need to begin to pray for your enemies. Father, we pray for those that have come against us, those that betrayed us, those that attacked us, those that drug our name through the mud, told lies on us. Father, we pray. I, and we bless them. We make the choice to bless them. Father, we pray that you would forgive them, that you would bring them into right standing with you. We pray, Father, that you would restore them. Father, the brokenness that's been in their soul, that you would bring them to you, that you would cause them to know you and come into right relationship with you. We choose to pray for those that hurt us. And Father, we pass this test in Jesus name. Somebody is praying that prayer to, uh, uh, concerning someone that abused you somebody watching me. You're praying that prayer concerning somebody that, that attacked you, that, that caused pain in your life. And the Lord said, it might not be easy, but can you pray for them anyway? Can you choose love anyway, even though it doesn't feel good, even though they were wrong and you were right? Some of you are in that position where it's not that you were wrong, but now you're passing the test and you'll pray from a place of love concerning them. Now, let me read this for you because this is the plot twist that's about to happen for your life for your ministry, for your family, because you chose to forgive, because you prayed for them. You don't got to go out and eat with them. You don't got to go and hang out with them. But let me tell you what the Lord is getting ready to do. So the Bible says this in Job 42 and 10. It says, and the Lord restored Job's losses when he prayed for his friends. Now that, that phrase, that sentence right there alone is a place that you can rejoice. And the Lord restored Job's losses when he prayed for his friends. Everything that he lost was restored because he passed that test. You're getting ready to step into chapter 42 of your life. This is Job chapter 42, where everything reversed in his favor. Everything was turned around. I just need somebody to post that on the screen. I'm stepping into chapter 42. We've already seen, many of you have experienced chapter one. You've gone through your own version of chapter two. And yes, you have to forgive and you have to let go of whatever the hurt was. And you've got to pray from a place uh, of truly a place of love saying, God, I bless 
them and I let that go. Now, when you pray that, there's a turning that's beginning to come in your life and you're getting ready to see a plot twist where we're about to step into the next three months called vindication. You're going to see it for the remainder of this month, but September, October, and November, you're going to see months of great vindication and reward. Many of you are getting ready to come uh, into a period of great restoration where things that you lost over the past 10 years are about to be placed in your hands, where what you experience, uh, the, the attacks of the enemy, the Lord says, I'm now going to give you double for what you went through. You're getting ready to see double come back to you, where it's going to be double the reward and double the breakthrough. It's going to be double the release from heaven concerning your life. You're getting ready to see the glory of God double and intensify on you, where the anointing is just going to sit on you in such a heavy way. Over the next three months, I'm telling you what I hear the Lord say, it's vindication time. And you're not going to rub it in the face of anybody. But the Lord says this. He said, I prepared a table before you in the presence of your enemies. I've already prepared the table and the spread is already set. And what you're going to do this time is you're going to pass your test and you're stepping over into chapter 42 of your life. This is double. This season is double. Now, this is very important. We're getting ready to step over into the Hebrew New Year. And I know that some of you don't study uh, Hebrew, but you need to because you got to understand that the scriptures were written in Hebrew and from a Hebraic mindset in the New Testament. And so God uses a completely different calendar than the calendar that we use. And so as we come over into the month of September, when we step into that month, it's going to represent a time of a crossover. We're going to see that we're going to come to the period where some call it Rosh Hashanah, but it is the head of the year that we're coming to where we step into a new year before the world comes into the new year. This new year is so loaded. I've got to come back on and do some teaching. Maybe next Monday, I'm going to come and share with you what it means. But this spiritual new year is so loaded. Uh, it is the year paid Dalet. Let me say that again in Hebrew. The year that we're coming into 5784, 2024 is the year paid Dalet. And it is loaded. It is a picture in Hebrew of a tent door. It's a picture of a door. This entire year is about an open door. Now, even though the picture of the door is closed, God is about to cause a major door to open and you're going to step right into a greater season than what you've ever experienced. And it's important that as we begin to cross over into this new head of the year, that we get our hearts right before the Lord. It's important uh, because there are going to be many shifts and changes that begin to happen in our world and within our communities, in our cities and within our nation. And some of the shifts that we're going to see are going to be sudden shifts. You're going to see it happen uh, where more shakings are going to come within our government, within the nations. You're going to begin to see it in, in America in this political season that we're coming into where it's going to be major shaking and even in the economy where again we're going to see some major collapse. Now, many of you know because you've been connected. I've been prophesying this uh, for a couple of years and we saw where the Lord gave me and I'm sure others the word concerning the banks that are going to collapse and the economy that's going to be shaken. And we saw that begin to happen. That's nothing that we rejoice about, but we prepare concerning it. And so even over the past few days, the fourth bank uh, just collapsed. And many people don't understand that our world has already been in a recession, whether they've announced it or not. We've already been in a recession, but in the kingdom of God, we will never see recession. We're stepping into greater glory and greater abundance, but we need to begin to prepare for the shakings that are coming in our world. And because darkness is going to increase, the light of God is going to increase even the more. This means that you're going to have to pick up your mantle and begin to activate it and walk in the purpose of God for your life. Now, I'm excited about what, what the Lord is doing in the midst of all the shifting. The Lord gave me uh, this book that I've been writing for uh, the past uh, year or so uh, called Mantled for Greatness. I'm excited because it's coming out and you can actually uh, pre-order it now. It's called Mantled for Greatness. And this is one that I've been working on for a while, but it 
it teaches you concerning your mantle, how to pick it up, activate that mantle and accomplish the purpose of God in the earth. Let me tell you this. You're going to be needed for the days that are ahead. Again, there are almost 7,000 of you on here watching live. You're going to be needed for the days that are ahead. The anointing on your life is valuable. And some of you feel, I don't have a title. I, I don't have ordination papers. Nobody uh, gave me a platform. You need to throw all of that thinking away because the Lord has need of you in the kingdom. This means on your job. This means in, in your community, in the grocery store, in the bank, wherever you're going, there is a need for you. But you're going to have to understand how to activate your mantle and walk in the purpose of God. And in this uh, book that I've written, I walk you through exactly how to do that and how to take the small that God puts in your hand and to maximize it and make it greater. Now, listen, not only that, uh, I have an announcement for you. I'm getting ready to come possibly to a city near you. We've got the mantle tour that is launching. Uh, this tour, I'm telling you, is going to be uh, so exciting where I'm coming to your city, to your area, to your region. We already have about 30 stops that are planned out, and it starts in the beginning of September. Again, I'm coming to your city, your region, your area, and I'm going to be uh, ministering the word of the Lord, preaching, prophesying, whatever the Lord leads me to do. And the first stops are here. Uh, that's a little bit too small to see, uh, but I'll, I'll make sure we get this uh, posted on my page. Uh, the first stops are actually going to be in Alabama. I'm coming uh, to, let me see if I can read this. I'm coming to Alabama and I'll get the exact name for you. It's Pastor Ty Dillon uh, in Alabama. That information is going to be up on my social media pages. Uh, that's going to be on September the 7th. And then on Friday, September the 8th, I'm coming to Dr. Shirley Brown. Uh, that's going to be in Wendell, North Carolina. That information is going to be posted for you. And then on uh, September, Saturday, September the 9th, I'm coming to Pastor Michael Woods, and that's going to be in Fayetteville, North Carolina. All this information is going to be posted on my social media platform, and you'll be able to see it all there. I want to see you in uh, whatever uh, city that I'm coming to near you. I want to see you. I want to meet you. I want to pray for you. I want to release the word of the Lord over your life, but I'm literally going all over the country. So uh, again, make sure you get this information. Uh, for the mantle tour. I'm coming to North Carolina, different parts of Carolina. I'm coming to Alabama. I'll be in Texas. I'm coming to different parts of Texas. I'm going to be there in Tennessee. I'm coming to you uh, in um, St. Louis, Missouri. I'm coming to you. Uh, it's so many places here, literally from California. I'll be in about four different stops throughout California, Arizona, uh, literally all over. So you've got to check this tour flyer to see where I'm going to be. And you're going to see more information coming up. But listen, I pray that chapter 42 of your life begins right now. I pray that everything begins to change for the better in your life as you forgive and as you begin to pray uh, for those that have used you, those that have done you wrong. Let this be the plot twist that you've been waiting for. I pray that the Lord brings vindication upon your life, that God rewards you for everything that you had to suffer through, and that these would be the days of vindication and great reward as we begin to come into these next several months. Father, we thank you for what you've said. We receive your word in Jesus' name. Uh, listen, I'll be back on here next month. Monday, as long as the Lord says the same, and I'll be sharing more with you concerning the Hebrew new year that we're coming into. And you don't want to miss that. Uh, listen, God bless you, everybody. I'll catch you on again next Monday, same time, same realm of the spirit. I saw that the earth is about to go through another shift. Uh, in this vision, I could see these vacancies and voids in the earth. It's as if there were mantles that were there that were just left hanging over the earth that no one had picked up. All of a sudden, I saw this army of believers that begin to rise up and they begin to pick up these mantles and walk in a dimension of the supernatural that we had never seen before. They received new mandates. They received new assignments from heaven. It's as if a lion was awakened on the inside of them. I believe that that is the time that we're coming into. And I wrote about this in my new book, Mantled for Greatness. This is going to be your time to rise up in your kingdom authority. Not only do I speak about a mantle, a 
what the assignment of your mantle is. I talk about how to unlock a God-sized dream. You can pre-order this book wherever books are sold, Amazon, Barnes & Noble. It's going to be released on October 3rd, but you can pre-order it now. It's your time to rise up in your anointing, in your authority. You are being mantled for greatness.